for everyone for so far. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, this morning with me and open them to the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3 this morning. We're going to be looking in here and some other passages of Scripture as well. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, our text verse will be 11 and 12. And our text verse here is we're looking at today on how do I prepare for the end times. And you may be thinking and saying, now wait a minute, you said we're living in the last of the last days and we would not be living in the end times. That is correct. But we know they're approaching and how are we going to prepare our lives and live our lives knowing that the end times are approaching very rapidly and soon. If you've got to find 2 Peter now, beginning in verse number 3, let's read it together, following along, beginning, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, and he's talking about the verses prior to that, verses 9 and 10, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation? What are we, what are we to be like in holy conversation? That's living, by the way, the word conversation, and godliness. In other words, as we see the approaching of the end times, we are to be living godly and holy. When's the last time you've heard a message on holiness? It's been a long time, hasn't it? What else are we to be doing as we approach these end times? We are to be looking for and the hastening unto the coming of the day of God. So Peter's giving us some instructions here as to how we're to be living. So the Bible never divorces the truth of Christ's return from everyday living. Our everyday living ties in with the matter of the fact of the truth of Christ's return and how we ought to be living. So today as we take a look at this, uh, we're going to try to discover how we should be prepared, how we should prepare for the certainty of the return of Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We bless you, Lord. Thank you for these wonderful men and the fathers and dads and and kids and daughters and all that we've had, and we really appreciate it. We praise the Lord for it. Thank you for your word now that we get to study it again. And we thank you for the freedom we still have in this country where we can come and study the word of God together and sing praises about our Lord and speak the name of Jesus uh, without apology, without hiding. And we thank you for that and we praise you for it. Lord, we ask you to bless the time in our word now as you always do. We ask you to anoint your word and by your Holy Spirit. We ask for that anointing upon your servant in this hour that we may be able to stand and proclaim the truth of God's word with power and with authority uh, from the scriptures. And Father, we'll receive it because we ask it in faith and believe it in faith. And Father, through all this, if there's any here today or those that are watching by television, radio, internet, YouTube, and so forth, Rumble, Father, if they've never come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, today would be the day that salvation would come to their hearts and minds and they would turn and trust Christ as their Lord and Savior and be born again into the family of God. And Father, we'll thank you for it and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Talking about the Lord's return and preparing of what's happening and coming down the line, it reminds me of a story. It's a true story, a story that, uh, that Billy Graham wrote a book called World of Flame. And in there he tells the story about a little boy named Paul and his father, Mr. Haley. And President Eisenhower was the president at that time. It was after World War II, and Ike was now the president. And he was visiting Denver, Colorado, and in the Denver paper, they had picked up this article that the little boy was six years old, Paul Haley, was, wrote and put it in the paper that he would like to see the president before he dies because he was dying with cancer. Well, that paper in Denver, the president, Ike, President Eisenhower, he caught the, 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 the article in the paper. He saw it, got his car together, told his security, get a car ready. We're going to see Paul. Unexpected, unannounced. He arrived at the door, knocked on the door. The father, Mr. Haley, answered the door. This is in Dr. Graham's book. He answered the, the door, and, and there was little Paul standing behind his dad, but his dad was standing there in old, dirty blue jeans, flip-flops, a dirty shirt, hair undone, unshaven. And he looked around him, and he said, Paul, and Mr. President stuck out his hand and shook his hand and pulled him out. He says, I'm the President of the United States. So Ike walked back to the car with him and had a conversation with him, shook his hand, and said, I'll see you later. 
He walked back in there, and the town, for years, the town talked about the day that President Eisenhower came to speak to little Paul. But his dad was not very happy about it. He wasn't excited about it, and matter of fact, he was quite embarrassed. He was embarrassed by the way he looked, the way he dressed, his clothes, unshaven, unwashed. He was just totally embarrassed of the unexpected visit and announcement of the President of the United States. That's why in 1 John 2.28, John writes, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Pretty good story, isn't it? I'm afraid today a lot of believers would be ashamed at his coming. Titus 2.13 says we're to be looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, if we're truly really looking for him and longing for him, we're going to be living for him. We're going to be living holy lives and separated lives and godly lives. And that way we can be assured that we won't be ashamed when he comes. Because see, folks, he's coming unannounced. He's coming by surprise and suddenly without delay. And we don't know when, but we need to be ready. And we need to be prepared. And he's a greater visitor than the President of the United States. So we're going to take a look at it this morning. And first of all, I want you to notice two truths that stand out and shine like beacons. And that is the truths about Christ coming. First of all, the first truth we understand is that the truths about Christ coming. We find out and we talk about the rapture and the second coming. Remember I told you the same word is used in both events? Just like I have a motor, but you know, there's a motor in ten different things. They're not all the same, are they? A washing machine is not my car. But I have a motor in both of them. And I use the same word, motor. Well, we use the same word for catching up of the saints in the rapture as we do for the second coming of Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17, this speaks of the rapture. This is the first truth of His coming. And by the way, His coming is certain. And we'll look at that in just a minute. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. In other words, we're not to, be, uh, not to have any understanding or not to know. We are to know concerning them which are asleep, that's those that have died in the Lord, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, how many believe that this morning? Amen. How many believe Jesus died and rose again? Okay. Even them also which sleep, that's those that are in the graveyards that know Christ, that have already died, in Jesus God will bring with Him. Now wait a minute, if they're dead in the grave, how's God going to bring them with Him? Because the only thing that's in the grave, folks, is a body. This earthly tabernacle, physical body, but to be absent from this body is to be at home with the Lord in glory. And God's going to bring him with him. Which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him? For this I love this, for this I say unto you, not by, by the word of the church. Well, I want to see how many are following along with me. For this I say unto you by the word of the denomination. For this I say unto you or by the word of the independent Baptist church. Or the prophets, no, this I say by you of the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Here we go, church, what's Michael going to do? Michael's going to announce the rapture of the church with the voice of the archangel. Who's the archangel? Jude 9, Michael. And with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen. That truth stands out like a beacon of a shining light in light of what's coming down the pike. A second truth is found in Zechariah. Because you see, that's the rapture. We might say that's the first coming of the first phase. But he's coming again called the second coming. We find it in Zechariah 14, verse 4. And his feet, now you notice in Thessalonians, we're going up to meet him in the air. Hello. Here's the difference between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. Using the same words, 
Okay, but two different events, two different time periods. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and towards the west. In other words, you see, Jerusalem is the highest point there, where the temple is in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the highest point in Israel. It's up on a mount. It's not mountains like we think, but a mount is the highest point. That's going to split when Jesus lands on the Mount of Olives. That's where he left from when he ascended in Acts 1, 11, 8, 9. He ascended into glory from the Mount of Olives. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. And when he does, it's going to split in half. You see, it's going to create a large valley. And that's going to, you know where that valley's going? It's going east to the Dead Sea, and it's going west to the Mediterranean Sea. And then half of that mountain is going to go north, towards north of Jerusalem, and the other half is going to go south to Judea down. And that water, living water from the Mediterranean, is going to bring to life the Dead Sea. Oh, it's hallelujah time. Okay. And there, and there shall be a great valley, and half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it towards the south. That is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Both of these stand out like a bright and shining beacon today. So, matter of fact, just to help you out a little bit, did you realize there are over 300 references in the New Testament of the second coming or of the rapture? Just in the New Testament? One out of every three refer to either one. You know, folks, Jesus promised, I will come again. Amen? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did. Matter of fact, one out of 30 verses refer to the rapture. Christ is certain. Christ coming, first of all, we're looking at these two main points. Christ coming is certain. Y'all believe that? John 14, 3. Look down at the bottom of your notes there a little bit. You got it there. All right, this is a Jesus, is it, he's in the Lord's Supper now. We're at the night of the Lord's Supper. They're in the upper room. This is night before his betrayal and his arrest and so forth. And, you know, he's telling them in verse number 1 of John 14, 1, he says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He comes to verse 3. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where you may be there, I may you may be also. That's the rapture. Are you with me, church? It's certain. Matter of fact, one out of every 13 verses in the New Testament have to do with his return. And yet, why aren't more preachers preaching about it? Why aren't they preaching more about the second coming and the rapture of the church and the tribulation hour and the end times and all? Probably because most of them don't believe it. Many of them not even saved. Which men of Galilee, can you imagine these guys are standing here, they're gazing up into heaven, and Jesus all of a sudden, under no spaceship, no spacesuit, no rocket man, no anything, just begins to lift off the planet, and they're standing there in total gazement. And all of a sudden, these two men in white apparel, angels, stood by and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, as you've seen him go into heaven, what this same Jesus, as you've seen him go into heaven, shall so come again in like manner as you've seen him go. How did he go? He went literally, he went bodily, he went visibly. I'm telling you, he's coming back the same way. Oh, this is fantastic. Taken up for you into heaven, shall so come again in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. So how did he go up? He went up literally, bodily, invisibly, and he's coming back in the same way. He went up in the clouds, and in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, Jesus said, Behold, I come in the clouds, and every eye shall see me. Second coming. Folks, this is all getting ready to happen. It's certain he's coming. That's the first point of these two wonderful points that stand out uh, unbelievably about Jesus' is coming is the fact that his, it's certain. Then I want you to know it's coming soon. Amen. Here's another truth that stands out like a beacon of light. That Christ's coming is soon. Matter of fact, rapture or death or second coming, he's coming in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. He's coming quickly in Revelation 22, 7, 12, and 20. He said, behold, look and see, I come quickly. That word quickly means suddenly, by surprise, and without delay. 
Matter of fact, you go over to Hebrews and read in Hebrews, it says, and it says, once we have done the will of God, it's talking about Christ's coming, it says he will not tarry, he will not delay his coming. So it's unscriptural to say if the Lord tarries. Now we're all guilty of that because we've all said it. But the writer of Hebrews says he will not delay, he will not tarry his coming. It's fantastic. So he's coming. He promised it. Listen to Romans. Paul writing to the book of Romans here in church. We'll get to it one night. While down the road yet. All right. And that knowing the time. What church? Paul is telling the believers here in Rome, we're to know the time. We're to know the time. He didn't say the date or the hour. Know the time. That knowing the time, that now, now, present tense, it is high time to awake out of sleep. Wake up, church. He's writing to believers here. Wake up. For now is our, present tense, is our salvation nearer than when we believed. David, you said you were saved 65, 66 years ago. I want to tell you something, brother. Your salvation is nearer today than it was 65 years ago. Even better than that, look at here. By the way, when Paul wrote this, he said, The night is far spent, the day's at hand. Whenever it says the day's at hand, you see that in Revelation right off the bat. When the day, that means just these things must shortly come to pass. They must happen quickly. Okay? Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. We're trying to get prepared on how to live before the end times. Cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Why? Jesus said, Ye are the light of the world. So we're to be light. Did you know when Paul wrote that, that was written around 66 A.D.? That was about 25 years after they were saved, when Paul wrote this right here. So, that since, so since they were saved, so in other words, it's, la it, it's later than it's ever been before. In other words, your salvation is closer today than it's ever been. It's near even at the door. Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour. But he said, you can know the times and the seasons. Hello. He said, know that when the fig tree blossoms and blooms, know that summer is nigh. And he's comparing that the fig tree is always in relation to Israel. Well, Israel bloomed and blossomed in 1948 when they became a nation. Then in, and then in June the 6th or June the 7th of 1967, I believe it was, the Six-Day War under that one-eyed patch general. Boy, you don't mess with that guy. And they did what? For the first time, they occupied all the land. Well, folks, that's been 67 years. Our salvation is closer and nearer than it's ever been before. We can know the season. So, the two truths, his coming is certain. And it's soon. And they shine like beacons in today in which we live. So that brings us to the second part here we want to look at. Let's look at some four principles for last day's living. How many believe we're living in the last of the last days? Well, by the way, and so we're going to look at these. So how to live in the last days. God's word always ties the end times in how we live together. Always ties it together. So let's take a look at it. All right, again, 2 Peter 3 there, he says, Seeing that all these things should be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for the hastening and the coming of the day of God? So how are we to live knowing the end times are soon? I want to share four of them with you on how we're to live. First of all, we are to live with hope. We are to live with hope. I know it sounds like doom and gloom and all of this stuff and all that's going on. But folks, that's God just simply warning us, get ready, he's coming. I'm telling you, the Lord right now is doing everything possible to warn the world, to tell the world, look up, Jesus is coming. He's coming soon and quick. It's time to get right with God. It's time to repent of sin as an individual, as a nation. You want to stop all that's going on as a nation? America, repent. Repent is the key. And so he's doing everything. So how are we uh, to live knowing that uh, we believe the end times are soon. I believe that with all my heart. How are we to live? We're to live with hope. Matter of fact, church, we're to live with hope even in the midst of all this turmoil, uncertainty, darkness. We're to live with hope. How many of you got hope? If you don't have hope, man, you've lost it. 
you got to have hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. On Christ the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Amen. Hope. My hope is heaven. My hope is the rapture. My hope is the second coming. My hope is a new body. My hope is glory. My hope is all, my friend. My hope is the millennium. This is my blessed hope. And all that heaven has to offer. We're to live in hope even in the midst of a world we live in today. So look, look what the psalmist said. This was going on in the psalmist's day. In Psalm 39, 7, the psalmist says, And now, present tense, Lord, what wait I for? In other words, well, what I'm waiting for. You know what he's waiting for? My hope is in thee. What are you waiting for, church? Your hope is to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your hope is not to be in Washington. It's not to be in the Social Security. It's not to be in the government. It's not to be in the current administration. It's not even to be in the new administration that's coming. I don't care who it is. Our hope is not to be in NATO or the nation. What is it? The nation? I don't know what. NATO, the nations? In New York, the United Nations? Our hope is not in any of that. Our hope is in Christ. In the coming of the Lord. Folks, it's not going to get any better. As we approach the end times, do you read it, the tribulation hour? It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better until Jesus comes. As a matter of fact, when he comes for the church in the rapture, it's going to get worse after we're out of here. For seven years, it's going to be bad. And so it's not getting, the world's not getting any better. Our millennials thought all that was going to happen. We were going to usher in the millennial of the kingdom and so forth by getting better. Well, they changed their tune on that after World War I and after World War II. They decided it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Okay? And the millennial is not in heaven. The millennial is not now. We're not living in the millennial. That's our millennialist. That's another time and another sermon. All right? Praise the Lord. Amen. All right, look at what Paul says in verse 13 of chapter 15. This is a prayer. He's closing out Romans almost here, and he's coming to a close, and he's praying now, present tense, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Did you see the repetition of hope? He is the God of hope, and Paul's praying that we would abound in that hope. That's an interesting word, and you look at the Greek word in that in other times where Paul uses it, and it's referring to grace and growing in knowledge, and when he says that you abound in this grace also, that you be abounding in this grace and growth. This is a different word that's used for this bound. This is fantastic. You ought to love this. This word abound, it refers to a river that overflows its banks. In other words, our hope ought to be like a river that overflows the bank, that our life is overflowing with what? With hope, with joy, with peace. That's what Paul prayed. How's your life overflowing today? That's what it ought to be. 1 Peter 3.15, put it this way. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready. That be is an present imperative, which means it's in a command. You are to be ready, church, in light of what's going down, that we're in the last of the last days, that we're approaching the end times. We are to be ready. What am I to be ready? How? Always. How what? Always. Well, what am I to be ready always about? To give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Did you notice Peter there didn't say we're ready to give an answer? He said to give her ready to give her the answer of this river of overflowing of joy and peace in your heart. He didn't say give an answer of doom and gloom. He didn't say give an answer of despair. He didn't just say give an answer of discouragement that's in you. No, you're supposed to have hope in you. Christian brother and sister, quit getting so discouraged and down in the dumps and, 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 and doom and gloom and despair and all that. Doom and gloom and despair, agony on me. You remember that song? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no, friend, you, you've got hope in you. You've got joy in you. You've got peace in you. And you ought to have the hope of glory in you. That's what Peter, uh, Paul prayed for these Roman believers here in Rome, that we would have that. 
And so the first thing that we ought to have in our principle of living in these days is hope, church. The world's looking for hope, and Christ is the only answer for that hope. And we have that answer. Peter said, you better be ready to give an answer. And I'm telling you, the Lord, the people are looking for hope. And that hope is only going to be in Jesus Christ. That hope's only going to be in a relationship with Jesus. Not a religion, not a church, not a denomination, not a person, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where your hope's at. Oh, I'll tell you, that's the first principle we ought to be looking at. All right, what's the second one? We're to live with insight. Now, this is really a good one with last day believers here in these last days and approaching the end times. I'm telling you, man, I think the church and believers have lost insight as to what's happening around them and what's going on. We're not supposed to be in the dark. We're not supposed to be hiding. We're not supposed to be ignorant. We're not, folks, matter of fact, uh, don't, 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 uh, my, my goodness, my, don't, don't uh, promote ignorance, okay? And don't put a premium on ignorance today. Here we have a story here in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. What's going on is Saul is after King David, and uh, there's, there's the men in the different tribes here, the southern tribes, have come to a collusion, over 200 of them, that uh, they're not uh, with Saul anymore, and they're going to leave Saul, and they're going to join forces with David. Okay? All right, you kind of get the, the picture here. All right? And so let's look what he says. And of the children of Issachar, now these are different tribes of Benjamin, Judah, and so forth. You can go back and read it in the Chronicles if you'd like. Which were men since this is Father's Day, men that had understanding of the times. Come on, men, in this church, you need to have an understanding of the times. It's not time to go hide. It's not time to be ignorant. It's not time to be I don't know or don't care, or I'm not worried what's going on around me. Yes, there is. It's time for us as men to know the times. That's what it says. Notice what else? To know what Israel ought to do. Men, we ought to know the times around us, and we ought to know what to do in these times. That's what the Scripture says. And God's looking for those kind of men on this Father's Day. These were heads of them, were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. They sided with the forces of David, and they did that over at Hebron. You can go read it there in Chronicles and get the history on it. These men, in other words, they understood what was going on in and around Israel. They understood the pol politically what was going on. They understood what morally was going on, what economically was going on. See, these were men that knew that, and they were going to do something about it. Now, I'm not mad. I just got the, I like to preach getting wound up. You know, you get a fire in your bosom. In your belly, you know, Jeremiah said, I have a burning desire to tell somebody. I had a lady used to go here all the time, and she used to say, man, the kettle was boiling this morning. And I looked at her, and what are you talking about? She said, oh, compared to so many others I listen to, she said, preacher, don't ever lose it. You have a fire in your bosom, in your belly. She said, that's what we need today is preachers in the pulpit that got a fire. Well, whether I do or not, that's okay. Praise God. These men knew what was going on. They knew that they needed to get involved in these matters. Let us not place a premium on ignorance. We need to know what's happening and what's going on. We do. We can't ignore it, folks. We cannot sit back and sit still. All we need for evil to triumph, which is triumphing, triumphing today, is for good men to do nothing. We have a responsibility today as believers to stand up, push back against evil, speak out against it. There's not enough doing it today. Well, we're afraid what Facebook will do. We're afraid what Rumble will do. We're afraid what AI will do. We're afraid what the government will do. I'd better rather be afraid of God, what God will do, than what any of them would do. Amen. So that's the second way we're to live. We're to have an insight. The third way we're to live today is to live with action. We need to know and to know what to do in these times in light of what is happening and going to happen. We need to be men and women of action. Faith is an action verb. It is not passive. We're not to sit back on our blessed assurance and do nothing. 
That's why we're in the mess we're in today. That's why the church is in a mess it's in today, because preachers in the pulpit have sat back and done nothing. And I'm as guilty as the rest of them. Look what Jesus said. Live with action. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 13, Ye are the salt of the earth. What are we? Salt. But if the salt has lost its savor, in other words, if the salt has lost what it's supposed to do, its smell, its odor, its taste, it doesn't do nothing anymore. He said, wherewith it, then how's it going to be salted? It should therefore says good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Salt preserves, and it slows down the decay. Are you with me now? Let's go back to Jesus' time when he preached this. What did they use salt for? They didn't have refrigeration, freezers, dry ice. So they used salt to preserve the meat. Now, eventually the meat would decay, but salt slowed down the decaying process. Now, what did Jesus say we are to be? Salt. We are to preserve. Now, we can't stop it from decaying, but we can slow it down. And someone says, well, wait a minute. We just said all this is going to happen. It's going to get worse and worse. Yeah, I agree. It is. No doubt. So why do we want to be salt? Why do we want to preserve? Why do we want to slow it down? Because knowing what's coming, we have more opportunity what we have left to tell people about Jesus. That's why we're to slow it down so we have a little more time to tell people Jesus is coming. It's certain. It's soon. You'd better be ready. And you'd better be prepared. That's why. Daniel put it this way in Daniel 11, 32. But the people that do know their God, how many of you know your God today? Amen. Shall be strong and do exploits. I said, okay, what's exploits? Look that up, Hebrew word. Take action. Take action. So, what are we learning in these four principles, how to live in these last days? To live with hope, to live with insight, to live with action. Let's look at a fourth one real quickly. We are to live with courage. To be salt and light in today's world, church, it's going to take courage. You're going to have to have courage to speak up, to speak out, to stand up. How many of you know A.W. Tozer? Have you ever read any of A.W. Tozer's books, especially on prayer? Huh? A.W. Tozer, and I quote, said, A scared world needs a fearless church. A scared world needs a fearless church. So John wrote in John 16, 33, Jesus said, In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Now I'll translate good cheer there in the Greek, and it says be of good courage. I've overcome the world. I like what he told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 in verses 6 and 7 and 9. He said, Joshua, my servant Moses is dead. Guess what? You're going to fill his shoes, boy. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. You sure you don't want to call Caleb to do this? No, that's my dog. No, Joshua, you're going to be the new leader. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. No man shall be able to ever stand up against you. Wow, what a promise from God. Therefore, I command you to be strong and of good courage, in verse 6. Verse 7, be courageous. In verse 9, be courage, have courage. We're to be men and women today in the church to have courage in these days in which we live. We're to live with hope. We're to live with insight to know what's going on. We need to be men and women that will take action. And we need to have courage in these days in which we live. And that's what it's going to take. Amen? Well, praise God. So let's look at the first priority of the last days. We're about to wrap it up now. 
All right, what did we look at first of all? The two truths. What are the two truths that stand out like a beacon? Christ is coming is what? Certain, and it is soon. How are we to be living in these last days? With hope, with insight, with action, with courage. That's what we need to be doing. Now, this is all coming out of the Scripture here, what we've been reading. So let's take a put a priority. What's the first priority of the last days, since we're in the last days? Are you ready for them? Really tough, okay? So how can we be at peace with God? We have to ask the question. All right, so the first priority of the last days is, church, here it is. Those that are listening by watching by way of Rumble, YouTube, television, radio, here it is. You'd better make sure you have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the first priority. You better know you're saved born again. That's the first priority in these last days. If you haven't done that, my friend, let me encourage you to do so. Do not leave this building or walk out of here lost without Christ. We're in the last of the last days. There's no doubt the end times are about upon us and about to start, and it will start with the rapture of the church. But if you wait till then, it's too late. And if you ever want peace, the world will never have peace until Jesus comes the Prince of Peace. But you can have peace in your heart. You can have peace today that passes all understanding by coming to the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal relationship with Jesus. That's how you get prepared for the last days, is to make sure you're in a right relationship with Him. I didn't say the right relationship with the church, the right relationship with the denomination, with somebody else's faith, I'm talking about a right relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. You'd better know that. That's the first priority. And how does that take place to get this peace? Be ye reconciled to God. You've got to be reconciled. You say, well, what's that? Glad you asked. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. And you know why we've got to do that, folks? Because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. Because there's none righteous, no, not one. Amen. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Amen. We've all gone out of our way and become unprofitable servants. Amen. For we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the wages of that sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But God commended, demonstrated, proved His love to us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's justification. Sunday night, don't miss it. Amen. Paul put it this way in Romans 5, 1, therefore, being justified, that means being righteous, uh, being saved by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That word justified in that verse that Paul used, and we just looked at this uh, well, last week in our study here, the word justified, it's a legal term. It means to be uh, And read my own writing. Uh, it means to be declared not guilty. Are you with me? Not guilty, justified, freely forgiven forever. Because you see, church, we're all going to stand in God's courtroom and we stand guilty before God, all of us. Just in those verses I just read to you or quoted to you in Romans chapter 3. We're all guilty before God. But when we get justified, when we get saved, and we get born again, standing in the courtroom of God, God brings the gavel down and says, not guilty. Forgiven forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18-21. And all things are of God. How many things? Who hath reconciled us to himself. How? By Jesus Christ. Reconciled. You see, folks, we were apart from God, alienated from God, uh, separated from God, and we had to be brought back into a relationship to God, and that's through reconciliation. Hello. And hath given to us Church, we have the ministry of reconciliation. What is that? Reconciling men and women, boys and girls that are lost, back into a right relationship with Christ. That's our ministry. To wit, that God was in Christ, 
reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses upon them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's your ministry. You're a reconciler. Now then we are ambassadors, hallelujah, for Christ. As though God beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made, God hath made Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, justified. So you see, the first priority of the last days, you better make sure you're saved. You're born again. You've been reconciled. If not, Again, don't leave this place without it. You can do so right now today. Those of you that are watching by Rumble, you can do it right now. Those of you that will be watching later on Rumble, you can do it later today. Tomorrow, you can watch it on YouTube. In the next couple of days, it will be uh, edited, and all the boo-boos I make will be edited out, and you'll get a nice, clean cut one. If you want the boo-boos, come here. Amen. All right? I have a great editor. Oh, oh. You remember two weeks ago when we finished up that service that Jesus is coming back? And we had a little bit of delay there for my impact of the hallelujah. Well, my editor took care of that, see. And uh, I was watching it. And uh, when I said amen or whatever, boom, hallelujah came on. And you ought to see the picture in the background she has of the king of kings and the lord of lords riding on a milky white stallion. Of the gate of heaven coming out of the gate. Woo! I'm telling you what, it's dynamite. You ought to go watch it. You ought to go watch it. It's fantastic. Well, in conclusion, I want to tell you a little story. It's about a story about Satan having a meeting with three new apprentice demons. They're in the apprenticeship school of demons. And the devil says to him, he says, now, you need demons. Our job is to deceive as many as we can to keep from trusting Christ. That's what he does, ladies and gentlemen. So he says, I'm looking to see from you apprentices if you have any suggestions or ideas of how we can do that. So the first demon apprentice, he raises his hand and he says, we'll tell them there is no God. And Satan looked at him and shook his head. No, that won't work. Because anybody can look around and see all of this and realize all this creation, somebody had to be behind it. So the second demon raised his hand. He said, we'll tell the people there's no hell. The devil looked at him and said, no, that won't work either because everybody looks around and sees all of this crime and evilness and wickedness and knows that somebody's got to be punished somewhere. He said, so that won't work either. So the third demon raised his hand and he says, well, we'll tell them there is no hurry. And the devil said, that's perfect. You will deceive millions with that tactic. And I'm telling you today, that's what the devil says, the world, false preachers and teachers and everything. You got plenty of time. There's no hurry. Amen. But I'm telling you, you don't have time. Time's running out. You have no guarantee of tomorrow. None whatsoever. You have no guarantee that you'll even sitting in this auditorium and will breathe your next breath. We are all just one heartbeat away from eternity. One heartbeat. There's no hurry. That's what the devil tells you. Oh, you got time. I'll live it up and wait till I'm old and sitting on a porch in a rocking chair about half dead already. Then I'll call on the Lord. Friend, let me tell you something. Don't misunderstand this. Don't get this false conception. You don't call on him when you want to. You call on him when he calls you. The Bible says, for I have not chosen you, you have chosen me. But the Bible makes it clear in John, you can't call on him or come to him unless the Holy Spirit calls you. And when God is calling and knocking, 
you don't have time to say, well, not today, maybe later, some other time. I've got time. There's no rush. There's no hurry. Friends, you have no guarantee of tomorrow, the next day. Because I'm going to tell you something. If the trumpet sounded right now, your guarantee is over. It's too late. We've got nuclear warships sitting in Florida here right now off the coast of Russia. Pulled into the base over there in Cuba. Cuba has a nu- Cubans have a nuclear Russian submarine base in Cuba. 90 miles off the coast of Florida. This past week, a Russian warships decided to make an impact. Somebody even started a, a rumor that did the Russians leave a bomb for Florida? What if they did? Are you ready? Do you know Jesus? Have you been saved? What if their nuclear sub fires off one of those missiles out of them with a nuclear warhead and you're vaporized? See, the devil says you got time. Don't hurry. No, you don't, my friend. You have but one heartbeat away from knowing Jesus. Whom to know is life everlasting, eternal life, joy, peace, joy unspeakable and full of glory. Knowing that heaven is your home. Knowing everything about it. That's why Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Behold, look and see, pay attention, look up. Now, present tense, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next year, not when you get old and gray and feeble, not when you're laying on your deathbed. I've heard deathbed confessions before. I've led some to Christ on their dying deathbed. But you want to take that chance and that risk? I wouldn't, my friend. Gamble with your soul where you'll spend an eternity? That's why the writer of Hebrews in chapter 3, verses 7, 8, and 15, and chapter 4, verse 7, in those 13 verses, he said, Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today, today, Jesus emphasized it to the letters of the seven churches of Revelation. Five of those churches, he closed out the letter. He said, to him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. You know what the Spirit says to the church today? For whosoever will may come. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what the Spirit says. Amen. Do you hear His voice today? Those that are here, those that are watching, He's calling. He's calling. He's passing by. The songwriter wrote the song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. He's passing by. The end times are upon us. Christ is coming. It's certain. It's soon. Are you ready? As a believer, are you prepared? Are you living godly and holy for the Lord in these days? Are you giving an answer to those that ask of the hope that's within you? I hope so. If you're here today and you're lost without Christ, you've never been saved, born again by the Spirit of God from above, let me encourage you to do so right now. Don't waste any time. Don't hesitate. You want to know why we're doing all this in this prophecy conference, seminar, whatever you want to call it? Because time is short and running out, and people need to know what's coming down, and they need to come to Christ. We can't win them all, church, but we can sure try to win some. Paul says, I've become all things to all men that I might save some. We want to try to save as many as we can to take to heaven with us on the journey, whether it's here in Marion County, 
or in our state, the U.S., or literally around the world. It doesn't matter. People that hear this will come to Christ. You say, well, what about these foreign countries around the world that listen? I trust in God to take care of that. He promised that wherever we send his word, it will not return void, and he will accomplish his will and purpose wherever he sends it. So if it goes into China today, Korea, North Korea, Red China, Russia, okay? If it goes into these areas, it doesn't matter. God has a way of making his word known to the hearts of men and women. I may not speak those languages, but they may hear it in their language. I'm not there, but I don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit of God. If it's the will of God for people to get saved, they'll understand it. And they'll come to Christ. Are you saved? People say, man, you hound on that every week. Guilty. Guilty. Carol already knows what she's going to put on my headstone. If I have one. The rapture takes place, I don't need one. Here lies a man that was guilty of preaching the gospel. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We need to go. Time is up. If you're watching today by Rumble and you're still with us, you've never come to Christ, never trusted Christ, let me invite you to do so in just a moment. We're going to help those of you that are watching and listening, no matter where you're at. We had one last week listening to us on Rumble Live, believe it or not, from Africa. So you see, folks, we don't know where all this is going. He was anxiously awaiting to hear a message on hope. And we told him, stay tuned for today. It'll be here. So I hope he's watching. God bless you. And you don't know Jesus and you're there in Africa today. Why not come to Christ today? That's your blessed hope. You want the kind of hope we were talking about. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. So I trust you're listening and watching. And for any and all who are, we're going to pray now. It's not the prayer that saves a person. That's words communicating with God, talking to Him. What saves you is putting your faith and trust in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and Him only. And so we're going to pray, and the prayer comes right out of the Bible. We're going to be praying verses out of the Scripture for you to come to Christ today. And our plea of our church here today is literally we're begging you to come to Christ and to know the Lord Jesus, whether you're here or watching. So heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let's all pray and help one another and help those that are watching and listening. Dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord from heaven. I confess that I'm a sinner and I've sinned against you, God, in heaven. And I'm sorry for my sin. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. And he will, my friend, he will, right now. I do believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He took my place. He paid my sin debt. I believe he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so right now, by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you and invite you to come into my life and my heart to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die or at that rapture thing the preacher talked about. I thank you, dear Christ, for hearing and answering my prayer and giving to me eternal life, everlasting life. Lord, thank you. Now, as the preacher mentioned in the beginning, help me to live for you and to serve you till Jesus comes. And I pray this simple little prayer of faith believing in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. 
Thanks for praying with us, watching, tuning in. Whether you're here in the auditorium, thanks for listening. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.